slide. The Study and Faith series. Um, I am Matthew Bowman, the Howard W. Hunter Chair of Mormon History at Claremont Graduate University. Um, and this series is sponsored by the Claremont Mormon Studies Council and the Howard W. Hunter Foundation. Um, this is the first. We will be having firesides roughly once a month from here on out. Um, if you would like to get future announcements, you can register on your email with us at mormonstudies.cgu.edu. Uh, this week, we're pleased to have Richard Bushman with us. Um, we will, in the future, um, next week, have Judge Thomas Griffith, and the month after that, we'll have Nyland McBain. Um, so I'd like first um, to invite uh, historian Claudia Bushman um, to say a prayer, and then I'll introduce Richard. Mm -hmm. You just asked him. There you go. <laughs> Our Father in heaven, we come before thee at the beginning of this gathering of the larger Claremont family, and we pray, we are very grateful that we have this group of Latter-day Saints who meet together and who understand each other and attempt to learn of thee in thy ways, and we pray that this, this event this evening will be attended by those that are interested in it and that we will have um, a good opportunity to learn about one of the cultural aspects of the Latter-day Saint Church. We're grateful for uh, Richard Bushman for his preparation and pray that he will be able to think clearly about the things that he is speaking about and that we will be ha have things to consider after the fact and uh, consider how best we can deal with this information in our lives. This is our prayer and we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Um, Richard Bushman, I think, needs a little introduction to the Latter-day Saint community. Um, he is former Chair, our professor of history at Claremont Graduate University. Um, he is also the inaugural holder of the chair um, that I hold, um, and is the author of Rough Stone Rolling, a cultural biography of Joseph Smith. Um, but more than that, I think Richard Bushman is a mentor to a generation of Latter-day Saints. Um, I first met him in 2007 when I participated in one of the regular summer seminars he held for graduate students at Brigham Young University, and I've considered him really a mentor and a friend ever since. I know I am not alone in that. Um, I will now turn it over to Richard Bushman. I think you should all know as well, if you would like to ask a question, the chat function is disabled, but you may ask a question in the Q&A box that you see at the bottom center of your screen. Um, once Richard is concluded with his presentation, um, my wife Tamara and I will moderate questions for him. So with that, Richard. Thanks so much. Uh... Matt, and it's a uh, uh, good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be with you, even if it's uh, by way of Zoom. We're getting pretty good at uh, forming connections uh, across the miles with our computer screens in front of us. I was uh, very happy to uh, receive this invitation from Matt and um, from Christy Franson. Um, uh, I have a lot of affection for Claremont Mormon Studies. I'm still on the mailing list, so I get announcements of all your meetings and wish I could be there uh, when you're gathering to talk about papers. I was really delighted that Matt accepted this position as Howard Hunter, Howard Hunter Chair. He's uh, one of our most accomplished scholars uh, with a truly interesting mind and with excellent judgment. And I'm very pleased that uh, Christy uh, took over the leadership of the council. As we know, she's a world-class uh, mover and shaker, and I'm sure will have a powerful influence on uh, the program there. Claudia and I really loved our years at uh, Claremont. It's one of the happiest uh, periods of our, of our lives. We were very sorry to hear of the death of Ansel Min, who was the Dean of the School of Religion, uh, while we were there and a good host to us during our three years. 
And of course, the loss of Armand Moss uh, cannot be replaced. He was one of the founding fathers, a great soul, a great heart, and a very uh, generous mind uh, with uh, immense scope. So we still feel very close to these people and to all the friends that we made while we are in Claremont. <clears throat> Tonight, I am going to talk to you about the art of the first vision. Uh, it's not a topic I would have addressed five years ago, but over the past five years, Claudia and I have become involved in the Center for Latter-day Saint Arts. This center originated in a desire to make more of the artists in the church, to learn more about them, to learn from them, and to, mo to promote their, their work. Uh, as Latter-day Saints, we have a very rich artistic heritage, all of the arts, and we should know more about it <clears throat> and use the work of these artists to uh, enrich our lives. The center holds annual festivals where art by Latter-day Saints is uh, presented and discussed, arts of all kinds, poetry, music, painting. <clears throat> <clears throat> now we are planning a massive exhibition of Latter-day Saint visual art from the beginning to the present. It will originate in New York, will travel to Salt Lake City, and then perhaps to other places. If there's anyone here tonight who is interested in helping bring this show to Southern California, we would love to hear from you. Working uh, with the center has led me to take all kinds of art more seriously. <clears throat> Before COVID, we had planned our annual festival in New York on the theme of art and vision to pay our respects to the first vision on the 200th anniversary of its occurrence. We planned a day long symposium feeding, uh, featuring artists and scholars addressing the question of how we represent revelatory experience, our own and the revelations of others. To complement those presentations, we planned an exhibition of paintings and sculpture on the theme of art and vision. I was asked to give the keynote address on this same general theme and decided I would speak on visual depictions of the first vision, paintings and sculpture. There's a lot of it, and I figured that somewhere in all of these pieces, there would be something worth talking about. And my talk tonight is a report on what I found. I'm going to show you a lot of pictures, so I want to begin by bringing up this screen. Here is one of the best known First Vision pictures. Uh, it's, it's by Del Parson. It, there are hundreds of others. A big show at the Church History Museum a few years back is available online. Alex Baugh at BYU collected many images for a conference on the First Vision. Anthony Sweat, a BYU historian and a painter himself, has a comprehensive survey of First Vision art <clears throat> in the most recent issue of BYU Studies. <clears throat> If you simply Google first vision images, you'll get pages and pages of art. So there was plenty to work with. The question was what to do with it all. I began with the question proposed for a day long symposium scheduled for the festival. We planned a series of sessions where four scholars would team up with four artists to talk about representation. In its simplest form, the, the word representation refers to the process of taking something you see or experience and transferring it into a work of art on paper or canvas in words. If you're a painter, how do you capture a person's personality when you represent her uh, on on the a flat surface? How do you uh, depict the shade on a side of a house? 
you see it, <clears throat> but what do you put on the camp canvas or sketch pad to represent what you see or feel? How do you represent the reality of your life and experience in a work of art? <clears throat> Representation is not only a problem for artists, it is a problem for prophets, as it is for anyone who receives a revelation. Hold on. I'm sorry, I'm not. Pete's sake, I don't know why it's not moving forward here. Hold on, we'll start again. There we go. So I'll go back to where I was. Here's one of the best known first vision pictures by Del Parsons. And um, this is one of them I'm working with. But it's not only a problem uh, for artists, I wanted to say, but it is it's a problem for prophets, the problem of a representation. It is one thing to, to see God or an angel. It is another thing to describe the experience, what you say or show to get across the mighty vision you have seen. What did Joseph Smith tell his father after seeing Moroni? We have the same problem when we bear our testimonies on fast day. Seen in this light, writing scripture is an artistic problem. What can prophets draw on to convey what they have experienced to people who have not experienced it, but are interested? Joseph Smith went to the grove, knelt, wrestled with demonic forces, saw God in Christ, and spoke with them. When it comes to writing down this experience, what does he say? In his history, as found in the Pearl Great Price, he tells the whole story in six verses. In those verses, he never names the visitors as God and Christ. He refers to them as personages. But somehow, he gets across who they were and does it in two verses, the ones on the screen. <clears throat> What statements, what cultural elements were available to him to tell the story? The words he chooses are two personages, brightness and glory, they stand above him in the air, one points to the other and says, this is my beloved son. <clears throat> the clues as he goes along are laid out deliberately. Two persons raises the possibility of there being God in Christ without quite clinching the identity. Could be Moses and Elias. Brightness and glory are characteristic of angels as well as deities. Standing over him in the air is also angelic. Only this is my beloved son nails it down. We know it because words very much like those were used by the voice from heaven at Jesus' baptism, and again at the Mount of Transfiguration. My point is that Joseph had to select elements from his culture to paint a word picture of the father and son descending to earth, and is able to do it without naming them. In making selections, he was an artist, coping with the problem of representation. What strokes depicted the experience? My question then is, how do artists choose to represent the first vision? To approach this question, I reviewed the numerous visual depictions, asking how have painters transferred the elements in Joseph's 
uh, six verses onto a canvas. By now, artists have it much easier than originally. Latter-day Saints looking at the picture know immediately what is being depicted. The two luminous beings stand above a boy, uh, doesn't, have to, doesn't have to speak the words. We know they are the Father and the Son. One reason is that artists have not only pictured the words in Joseph Smith's account of the event, they have developed conventions that they pass on to one another. Elements not found in Joseph's description carry over from painting to painting. One example is the raised arm. It appears regularly, often with different meanings. Sometimes it is in wonder or praise, sometimes gesturing toward the two beings as if drawing attention to them or saluting them. Other times the arm seems to shield him for the overwhelming light and glory. Both of these paintings raise the arm as a shield or in surprise. These are Utah artists uh, who, uh, for whom this, all the conventions of the painting are well known. It really wasn't necessary for them to use the arms, but they did. They used the conventions. The raised arm convention was much more useful for artists from other regions of the globe who may not have been quite as familiar with what Latter-day Saints would uh, expect. These two were painted for the Biennial Global Art Show. They picked up on this convention, not from Joseph's words, but from their predecessors. Some are trained artists, like uh, Jorge Coco Sotanelo from Argentina, who used Cubist techniques to tell the story. Others were untrained, like Emile Wilson from Sierra Leone, an artist who was trained in letter to sync conventions enough to include the upraised arm. As I went through these pictures, I began to look clo more closely at their differing configurations and think about all the decisions an artist has to make to tell the story. I eventually decided, after looking at a lot of them, thinking about them for quite a while, that if Joseph was by necessity, an artist of words for him to tell his story of the first vision. The artists who paint the story are of necessity theologians of depiction. In trying to represent the first vision, they tell us what they think about God. They make theological judgments. That is the main point of my talk today. They are theologians of depiction. To focus my attention as I looked at these works, I decided to consider them <clears throat> in a number of key issues, crucial issues. The first is what the paintings tell us about the nature of God. What sort of a being is he? What is he like? The second is his relationship to his children on earth. When humans encounter him, how does he relate to them and them to him? And third, the, God's relationship to his own creations, to nature, the world he has made. Once I got these things in mind, I went back to the pictures to see what they told us about the nature of God, God's relationship to humans, and his relationship to nature. These are all, as you can see, theological matters. That's why I'm arguing that the artists of necessity have to make theological judgments. Consider this linoleum block print cut by Warren Luke. The first question that thrust itself upon me as I looked at it was what does Luke think about God's relationship to nature? As I see it, Luke thinks God may have created the world, including the grove where Joseph kneels, but he now comes as an outside force. He is not part of the natural world as we experience it as humans. 
He pierces that world, entering with a blast of light. His energy does not burn up the trees. They stand silently observing their creator and sheltering the prophet, solemn, dignified, intact. But God is from another sphere, one of light and glory beyond anything we know. He is supernatural. Luke's comments, comments also on God's relationship to the prophet. Joseph has made very small in his picture. He's not terrified or intimidated, but he is humble. He silently kneels in the light, waiting for God. He does not look up into it, the light, but kneels with bowed head. Luke's, Luke's deity is powerful and glorious. He comes from another sphere and enters the world with a burst of light and power. He is overwhelming. At the opposite end of the spectrum is Minerva Teichert's first vision. Her Christ and God are not invasive at all. They blend with nature and feel very much at home in this flowery wood. They have seemed to have strolled onto the scene rather than descending in power and glory. Their feet are on the ground, not elevated a bit. Father has um, the trilliums grow up around him, those little flowers around their ankles. The light, light surrounds their heads, but is not dazzling, just sweetly hallowing. And what of their nature? This is a friendly pair. The father has his arm around the son's shoulders. They're on very good terms. There's a subtle comment in their beards. The father's beard is slightly grayer than the son's. Does that suggest God ages? Does he change as humans change, growing wiser as he grows older? And what of God and humans? Joseph is not terrified or overwhelmed as the Joseph in Luke's woodcut might have been. He is astounded and marvels and perhaps curious, but he is not flattered by the appearance of these two. He looks them in the eye, nor is he separated from them by either light or distance. His feet almost touch their robes. They're also on the same scale. God and Christ are no bigger than adult humans. Joseph feels he can approach them without fear. I think these are important theological reflections. Each of the pictures creates a universe where God, man, and nature dwell together. They present, however, quite varying images of God, man, and nature. Is that a problem? Does it trouble us that two artists imagine the first vision so differently? I don't think so. However great the difference, we don't imagine the two artists in combat with one another. Each presents his view mildly, humbly. They're like testimonies in a testimony meeting. We, we report to one another about our dealings with God, each from our own perspective. The pictures don't require us to take a stand. We can contemplate the two universes projected by the two artists quite peacefully. They simply bear testimony of two individual conceptions of the place of God and man in the universe. As I reflected on artists as storytellers, <clears throat> I also thought of another aspect to artistic depiction, time. To the categories of God's nature, his relationship to humans and his relationship to nature, we can add time. Of necessity, painters and sculptures freeze time. They depict one instant in the story that Ben began before and continues after. The story sweeps through the painting from the events that preceded it, the painting's moment, to the events that follow. The artist's choice of a particular moment implies that she thinks that something is to be learned by pausing at this point 
rather than at a point before or after? What can be highlighted at this moment, perhaps better than at any other time? In his first vision painting, Paul Forster chose the moment a few seconds before the others we have been looking at. Joseph is still escaping from the dark forces that overpowered him and is not yet composed enough to look up and notice that God and Christ are there. <clears throat> He's still terrified, fleeing from the enemy that grasped him and not yet able to notice the divine light. By selecting this moment, Forster shows us another side of God, God the protector against evil. This is a God whose function is to drive off dark forces. He has the power to send them away. The father stretches out his arm to demand the spirit's departure. He is a little fierce, but not too much. He carries no weapons. His hand is not a fist. He is not about to deliver a blow. His arm and hand are graceful, like a ballerina's extended arm. At the same time, he is stern and forbidding. This is confident power. God is a warrior, but a graceful warrior, strong, but not fierce. Jesus, on the other hand, is concerned for Joseph. He senses the boy's terror and reaches out a hand of comfort and aid. He seems about to speak words of reassurance. He shows the other face of God. While the father is the stern defender against evil, the son is comfort and compassion. The two are well lit. Their clothing is much brighter than Joseph's dark form. They come from a realm of light. But it is not a sharp white light. It is slightly dimmed with cream. It is not glaring or frightening in its brilliance. The pair are powerful, but not ominous. The sovereign glory is mirrored in their relationship to nature. Like Tiger's pair, they walk in the grass. They might just have come from around behind the tree. They are part of nature. The wind blows their hair. They are not in any way outside of the natural world. The same is true for the dark forces. These vaguely human forms look almost like the limbs of the trees. The angle of their forms nearly parallels the huge tree behind them. The dark forms are set off by their bluish green color, somewhere between the light yellow of the divine beings and the dark green of the trees. I find this an enthralling depiction of the first vision theme. Forster makes God a creature of nature a kind of woodland deity, powerful and energetic, but intertwined somehow with the great trees and the grass. God is a protector of the boy who has ventured into the woods. He is a guardian who oversees and guards his human friends against the perils that lurk in the forest. All this we see best in the moment, just before Joseph notices God's presence. Forster's choice of a different moment in the first vision allows him to envision a distinctive view of God in the world he lives in. Other artists chose to light up other events along the series that led from the cabin to the grove and back again. Their choices are significant theologically because they point to a particular aspect of the whole story. In storytelling, anticipation is all. The artist tries to arouse suspense over what might happen. The reader has to feel that something is on the way. Danger, sorrow, loss, love. That is what makes mere happenings into a story. The feeling of anticipation and a need to see how that anticipation is resolved. Will the boy get the girl? Will the detective identify the criminal? Will humanity survive? Walter's Rain's picture of Joseph entering the grove makes the instant before kneeling the anticipatory moment. We know the outcome beforehand. Nevertheless, we wonder how Joseph feels right now. Does he sense anything? 
Is he afraid? How will he react when God comes down in the pillar of light? Does he have any idea how his life will be transformed? A myriad of questions is raised by this hesitant figure entering the grove. <clears throat> George Andrean chose instead to walk home after the vision. The light and glory, the heavenly figures, the question, the answer, the charge are all behind him now. The boy stands at the boundary of light in the grove behind him in the everyday world across the fields in front of him. He is likely still confused. What does it all mean for him? How is he to live his life now? What is he to tell his family? He is stunned, puzzled, a little afraid. The picture makes us think of the new burden that has fallen on Joseph. How can this boy hold up under the responsibility of knowledge? The picture causes us to wonder about carrying on a life between knowledge of divine wonder and the complexities and tawdriness of ordinary life. How can these be reconciled and joined? It is an exquisite moment in time that brings questions to mind that other pictures do not raise. Finally, we have George Edward Anderson's glorious depiction of the sacred grove 80 years later. It is a picture of the aftermath and a masterpiece of perspective and lighting. The space still has majesty. For those who honor the first vision story, it looks like a place that God could visit. The massive rising trees frame the space. The bright sunshine floods in as if God was descending again. We can imagine the sun as a column of light as if we were experiencing the vision ourselves. <clears throat> The lone figure stands in the woods. He is not a boy. He's a 20th century man standing still in the light and under the covering of the great trees. He knows about the vision. He is reverent, wondering. This picture suggests he is having a taste of vision himself. It is reoccurring and made for others who come to the grove and pause to look and listen. So our artists tell us things about events that we might not have imagined ourselves because they must think before they paint, they paint. Their eyes are opened. They open up possibilities for us to explore. They don't require us to believe what they see, but they direct our eyes and minds. We may find dimensions and possibilities that resonate with us and enrich our own beliefs. If the dimension of time alters the meaning of the first vision, when we drop in to observe the sequence of events, so does the dimension of space. What if we look at the event from another place in the universe, or even on our globe? Not Salt Lake or Seattle, but Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire, or Jakarta, Indonesia. Art by Emile Wilson from Sierra Leone reminds us that the first vision must undergo translation into many cultural languages as it goes around the world. Although the depiction is from another culture, we know in an instant that Wilson is picturing the first vision. Joseph is recognizable as he sits on his, the ground with his arm raised and his red hair shining. The flora is different. The trees are not the firs, in the hickories of American forests. They're plants of the savannas, but they still frame the people. God does not come down into nature. The two beings walk through the nature to get to Joseph. This is not our God in his usual toga uniform, but clothing is of great importance. There's no reading aiding light to identify the Godhead. Their grandeur is all accomplished by the plenteous white clothing flowing out from their bodies. Clothing is the only clue that this is a glorious being, but God and his son are honored and exalted here as they are in all our paintings. The picture is by an artist from another culture 
but one who has familiarized himself with Mormon ways. Looking at this mola, my personal favorite among all the depictions, we are again reassured, reassured by the familiar Joseph with his uplifted arm. We know the two figures of the father and the son, even though they do not radiate light. They are set side by side, looking down at Joseph sitting on the ground. We are not terribly surprised when they realize that they're not only not luminous, they're black. We think how intriguing every culture sees the father and the son in familiar ways as people like themselves. We are truly part of a world church now. That is, of course, an obvious truth. We all see God as people like ourselves. We, meaning me and my family, have colored our pictures as our culture demands, as light-skinned, blue-eyed deities. More likely the Christ who walked on the water at Galilee was swarthy and with heavy brows, dark eyes, and a black beard. But we want him to look like us, so we color him familiar. And so does every other culture want its own familiar coloration. That is part of making him our own. Ideally, when people walk into our churches, they will find pictures on the walls that they can identify with whatever their skin color. The question of color, however, as important as it is these days, is only part of a larger question about culture. How much has God consented to show himself to us in terms we can understand? How much larger, more magnificent, and different is the divine being in its own reality? How shuddered is our vision because we live on a particular continent, on a particular planet, at a particular time? Seeing with God with a black face compels us to realize we may be in for many surprises when we actually see God. The Panamanian Mola forces a kind of humility on us. Artists from other places compel us to realize God likewise comes from another place and we must be prepared to accept him as he is, perhaps far different than we have imagined. My message tonight is that art can be a teacher. It can help us see and understand God in new ways. Artists must think about their work before they pick up pencils or brushes. They must search their souls to discover what they can represent with passion and conviction. Their work bears testimony of what they learn from that soul searching. They can add dimensions we had never imagined. If we are to search the scriptures, artists can be our guides. We won't learn much if we sweep by their work with only a glimpse. But if we show respect to the artist's efforts by pausing and pondering, we may find riches we never dreamed were there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, that was um, insightful, but also, I think, um, beautiful, um, as much your insights as the art you shared with us. Um, we'd like to spend uh, about 20 minutes or so now in a question and answer period, um, at the end of which I'll invite you, Richard, to just wrap up with some concluding thoughts. Um, this presentation is being recorded. Um, it will be available on the CGU Mormon Studies website um, eventually. And if you have any questions, um, you feel free to put them in the question and answer box, which you will see at the bottom center of your screen. Go ahead and simply tap that and type any questions you might have. Um, so I'd like to open um, with one fairly broad question, I think, and that is um, given the contours of LDS history, culture, and theology, do you see any special place that art should have for our lives as members of this community? 
It's a good question and uh, is very relevant to us right now because um, because we're so involved in the Center for Latter-day Saint Arts. And I think um, there are two things we should um, at least consider. Um, one is that we have people who are producing art. And this art has many purposes, but I think one is that it stands in the tradition of testimony bearing. Uh, there are not many churches where they devote a quarter of the, of the sacrament meetings each month to individuals standing up and just spontaneously saying what, how they feel about God and their lives. And that in a way is an invitation to artists to bear their testimony through, through their work and for us to show respect to it um, by the, for the same reasons. Are you getting me all right? Um, okay, I got an unstable, stable sign. So, uh, and the other is that we believe in a material God so that uh, the material becomes holy and divine. And what we do in the material world and space and time uh, partakes of the same nature of existence that God partakes of. And so I think it, it sort of hallows the whole work of any kind of art, architecture or sculpture or dance, whatever, just because our God is an embodied God. Another question that's come up in the thread has to do with um, how do we balance truth or historical accuracy with interpretation and testimony and what we perceive as beauty? Um, truth and historical accuracy. Um, well, that presumes that um, truth is fixed, historical accuracy is fixed. I see just a little smirk on Matt's face because historians know that historical truth, at least, is not fixed, it's not stable, it's in constant flux and subject to innumerable interpretations. But um, uh, I think that uh, as a point of fact and reality, um, there is a common world where we try to reach agreement on what is truth, that's out there. But ultimately, each of us has to decide for ourselves what is the truth that works for us. It has, our religion has to become personal. It can't be just something that's out there and fixed and never moving. We have to make it move within ourselves. So I know there's a tension between there. The questioner is quite right in implying that. But I think you just have to learn to live with the fact that there's a constant dialogue between you and the world outside you and just live with that and rejoice in the chance it gives you to make your life your own. And given that question, that the role that art plays in our personal experiences of our faith, um, what role do you see art having and what role should it have in our meeting houses, our temples and places like that? Well, it's a good question, and of course, uh, very relevant now because of these uh, recent statements about foyer art, which is seeing art as decoration, trying to, uh, I think the aim of that statement was to try to create a foyer environment that is stable and welcoming and dignified. Uh, but it said nothing about art classrooms or bishop's offices. And it seems to me there, we are free and perhaps even invited to teach from art, to use art to instruct us, because contemplating art is sort of like contemplating the scripture. You look at it, there's something there, but if you think about it more, if you, if you wait upon inspiration to come, new thoughts will come to you and you'll find out things that you, um, you didn't know before. So I think my aim is, I think we all should be studying art as a way of learning about ourselves and to take advantage of these beautiful things that can be so potent. And so you've touched on this a little bit, but if we could go 
uh, in a little more depth, what role do you see LDS art playing in nurturing a globalized LDS community? Well, it began years ago with the uh, biennial global art exhibit at BYU where people were invited to from all over the world to submit art and we get a little taste of it. These, the Mola, uh, the two Molas we saw came in as part of that exhibit. So art, as I suggested, when you get artists saying different things about God, it's not combative. It's, it's, uh, it's a way to exist uh, with different perspectives, but peacefully. And I think that that's true um, for, um, for all art in all of our relationships. What we have to learn to do, however, is to pause before we scoff. We, it's so easy to scoff at modern art, for example, it's abstract or any child could do that. But it's, it's modern art, and even abstract art, can be immensely powerful. We have to learn from it. And similarly, from these art from other places, we sort of think of it as cute, or isn't that darling? Isn't that a sweet little piece of art? But art from other countries can be just as potent, just have such the same impact that uh, the big art that we like so much. So I'm all in favor of, uh, of bringing it in and working with it again. And eventually, of course, we'll have to put it in our temples and it will appear there and uh, other peoples will be represented uh, in those places. Along those same lines, and we had a couple of questions about the relationship between LDS art and non-LDS art. And um, I had a questioner who was interested in your perspective on non-LDS art and if there is anything that you feel LDS art might be able to learn from art from other Christian traditions. Um, this questioner in particular invokes the Byzantine Ponto Crater and mosaics in um, their basilicas. Yeah. Right. Well, at our first festival, 2017, it was held at Riverside Church uh, in New York. Uh, Sister Uchtdorf was on our board of advisors, so Elder Uchtdorf came to the festival. And uh, after one of our sessions, he came up to me and we were just chatting. And he said, uh, you know, this distinction between Latter-day Saint art and non-Mormon art uh, may have to dissolve in time. Isn't Michelangelo a Mormon painter? And I think that's true, that there will come a time when all art will be ours. We may see it with Mormon eyes, we may use it in certain ways, which I think we have every right to do, but we'll just find goodness everywhere. And I really look forward to that day. So how can we as lay members of the church promote diverse art? And I do want to couple this with a question from one individual who is starting a um, master's in art history here pretty soon and is looking at what are some areas of LDS art that perhaps are understudied? Uh, what was the first question again? Tell me that. How can we as lay members promote diverse art? LDS art. Yeah. Well, um, we have suggestions about what goes into a foyer, but we're free to put art up in classrooms. Uh, bishops are free to use art. Of course, you have to keep it within bounds, of course. But I think uh, we're all quite uh, open to do that. If I may promote our cause a little bit, uh, weekly we send out a art companion from the art center, an art companion to come follow me, which takes the scriptures for that week and matches it with an original painting by an LDS artist and usually a comment by the artist and what, what it means, which is really an invitation to sort of let the art and the scripture talk to one another and see what you get. So it just becomes a matter of a habit, one, of bringing art into a classroom or a teaching situation or a family, not just as an illustration, not just as 
this is what it looked like, but as a reading of the scriptures or a, an explanation of the scriptures which we study. So we can do it in our own classrooms, in our own homes. Uh, there are many, many opportunities. And I really recommend the Art Companion uh, for those of you who are using Come Follow Me. Great, thanks Richard. And I have put into the chat uh, the website for the Center for Latter-day Saint Arts. Um, and so anyone who would like can see the link there and sign up for these. Um, we had a question more about the First Vision itself, which is to say, um, have you learned anything new about the First Vision? Um, and or anything more about that we haven't usually discussed when we discuss it from studying all of this art? Um, have I learned anything new about the First Vision from studying the art or from, um, well, yes, from studying the art, I've learned a lot. I, I was thinking for a moment of any historical fact I stumbled across that might just thrill you to know. From the art, yes. I mean, Paul Forster's um, depiction of art was um, of the first vision uh, really was thrilling because he departed from things. But this picture of God as a protector, as God driving off the demonic forces, that really registered with me. It's a view of art that goes back to the Middle Ages, but a large part of God's function was to protect people from the demons in the world. And I would like to see that revolved, because, revived, because we all have our demons. And if we thought as a God as a protector who would sort of keep these evil forces at bay, I think that would be a lovely addition to our theology. Oh. You talk about art being an expression of testimony. So I'm curious to know if you were to paint or otherwise create a picture of the first vision, what would you emphasize? What would I emphasize? Uh, you ought to um, look at the work of Anthony Sweat, whom I mentioned in the first part of the talk, who teaches religion, has studied the first vision pictures, has studied the first vision first vision documents and has as a painter he has an MA in fine arts has painted as accurately as possible what he sees in the documents and uh, it's a, it's an intriguing picture because it's quite different from uh, anything that uh, uh, any painter has done before because he's read those documents so carefully but I don't think I would I would do that. I think um, I would try to depict the God I know, the God I call upon, and picture that coming into the grove as a moment where we meet and where there's a chance to express gratitude. And he can say to me what he wants to say, but it's sort of communion. That's what I yearn for, is communion. And so I think I would try to put my own relationship with God uh, into the painting. Wonderful. And as we are wrapping up here, I think um, one more question before we'll ask uh, you to give us any final thoughts that you may have, but um, what do you see as the future of art in our church? That is, we, as you mentioned a moment ago that we use it primarily for decoration now, but do you see any different functions for art? And uh, I think our Questioner was thinking somewhat along um, the lines of Eastern Orthodox icons or some other sort of use. Mm. Well, I see uh, two um, powerful forces at work beyond the center. Um, one is that um, we have so many people who are doing art, uh, some professionally, many as a, a passionate hobby. I mean, it's more than a hobby. It's, it's absolutely essential of their lives. And those people can't be repressed. We need to look at what they're doing. Uh, so I think that that, that will just uh, inevitably uh, bubble up. I'm hoping in a book to go along with it, it'll be probably a 700 page book uh, covering Mormon art from the beginning to the to the present will uh, help us to form a framework 
so we know where to place art. Now our art is just sort of little pieces floating around in the universe. The art of Western civilization doesn't float around because we go to the Metropolitan Museum or we have textbooks. And it's all ordered. We see how it comes and how it fits. And this book will help us to do that. So as we look at art, we'll look with more understanding. We'll become familiar. It'll be the world we live in. And if we live in that world and have a framework, I think we will grasp art and, and use it to better advantage. Wonderful. Thank you. And we're grateful to you for being willing um, to stay up late. Uh, you're on the East Coast, we're on the West Coast, and um, share these thoughts with us. I wonder if you have any um, final concluding thoughts that you'd like to give, and then um, tomorrow and I will wrap it up. Well, thanks so much for inviting me. I, I, I can't see you, but I know you're there. And uh, I wish we were there in person. We'd love to to uh, spend more time in, in uh, Claremont and visiting our many friends, people we really love uh, from Claremont over the years. And the LDS Council was so important when Claudia and I were, were teaching there. So thanks again for having us. I would just say that um, the First Vision is a powerful event. Uh, it's one of the, what has been called an abundant event by a scholar named Robert Orsi, who also was interested in religion. And these are events that sort of overflow their own limits. And these, they have implications and result in activities that extend widely, even globally, and extend through time into the future. It sends out forces that uh, go along conduits and capillaries and arteries and veins and land in people's hearts and minds and affect their thinking and their, real, their reality. And it's not necessarily that everyone agrees that it's real. Many of these events are contested and yet they have a real effect in time and space. They work in history. It affects how people think of themselves, the choices they make, their hopes for the future. And probably the first vision is one of those abundant events has affected many of you on the Zoom line tonight. And uh, it certainly has shaped me and I hope and believe for the better. So thank you all. It's been a great pleasure to be with you tonight. Thank you, Richard. And thank you to all who attended. Um, if you could not see, we talked out at 471 attendees. Um, which is wonderful and I think um, speaks both to the compelling nature of the presentation. Um, again, for all of you in attendance, um, this is the first of uh, many events. You can sign up at the website that I have just put into the chat bar. Um, and if you put your email in there, you'll get regular announcements of our events in the future. On October 18th, we'll have uh, Judge Thomas Griffith um, recently retired from the Federal Appeals Court, um, who will be speaking to us about comity and what it means to have dialogue with those we disagree with. Um, in November, we'll have Nyla McBain speaking to us about the role of women in, and the role of the Royal Society, I should say, in particular in the 19th Amendment and the Crusade for Women's Suffrage. So we're grateful to you for attending. I'm more grateful to Richard for being with us. And we're glad, I think, that Zoom has allowed us all to be present together. I think far more than could be present maybe in any room on Claremont Graduate University's campus. So this is a blessing indeed. And uh, we will leave that with you. Thank you all for attending. Mm -hmm.